Hi, my name is Stanley Kobla. I can welcome to another exciting episode of China Now. It is the only show dedicated to bringing you all you need to know about China's advancing technology and happenings across the world. Now let's start off with China Currents, where Chris has a lineup of stories for you, including how Elon Musk's new Twitter restrictions is positively affecting Chinese social media Weibo. China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting-edge technologies. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to China Currents. I'm Chris. Summer is here and the rain is pouring down. Last Sunday, the municipality of Chongqing in southwest China activated a level four flood prevention alert after a round of torrential rains hit the region on Saturday. Twenty-four districts and counties in Chongqing had experienced heavy rainfall. As of July 3rd, a total of 189 rivers had exceeded the warning level. On July 4th, Wanzhou, Chongqing's largest district with a population of 1.8 million, issued a red alert and halted mass gatherings, classes, and businesses. Due to the continuous heavy rain, the railway department closed the line between Wanzhou Station and Qiwei Mountain Station for safety inspection. According to China Railway, staff soon discovered that part of the railway bridge had been damaged by flooding, causing it to partially collapse. Footage on social media showed a bridge in the middle of the bridge, with water gushing through and flooding areas downstream. Some nearby houses collapsed under the pressure. Scenes of rescue boats evacuating people in heavy rain were captured by netizens. On July 5th, Chinese President Xi Jinping urged authorities at all levels to give top priority to ensuring people's safety and property and to strive to minimize losses. Following his remark, the Changjiang Water Resources Commission announced plans to optimize flood control in reservoirs, including Three Gorges Dam, the Jinta River Dams, and Danjiangkou Dam, to stop flooding and reduce flood control pressure downstream. Floods and heavy rain are common during summer days in China, the only difference being their severity. The last major flood happened in 2021, when the central province of Henan suffered from an extremely heavy rainfall, resulted in 398 deaths. This year, the southern provinces such as Zhejiang and Shanghai have already suffered from heavy rains in mid-June. Since meteorologists have warned us that El Nino will occur this year, we will probably see more news about floods in the next two months. So next up, we have interesting news from Chinese social media. As we all know, Twitter's boss Elon Musk has a very, how should I put this, fickle personality. We have seen all sorts of bizarre actions after purchase Twitter. But no Chinese netizens has ever imagined that one day his policy in Twitter would have impact on Chinese social media Weibo in a good way. So on July 1st, Elon Musk announced a temporary limit on Twitter. According to the new policy, Twitter users can only read 800 posts per day if their accounts are not verified, and if they are willing to pay, that number can be doubled. According to this statement, the limitation is due to concerns over data scraping, which affects the real user experience. As we can imagine, the said policy met with criticism as soon as it was announced. Besides regular internet surfers, the new policy has also seriously impacted the artists on Twitter, whose income are connected with the amount of exposure that social media platforms offer. As a result, many Japanese anime illustrators were forced to move to other social media platforms due to the lack of exposure. And for some reasons, they found Weibo. Starting in early July, netizens on Weibo found out a bunch of new accounts with IPs located in Japan posting illustrations with Chinese captions that were clearly translated by AI. At first, netizens just thought they were bots, but after talking with the artists, people started to understand the reason. Many illustrators soon accumulated thousands of followers in a very short period of time. Some Chinese netizens thus commented, CEO of Weibo must be the one who benefits the most from Twitter's reform. They also joked that Musk's effort was 10 times more effective than Weibo's top executives in terms of pushing Weibo to the international market. So next up, a piece of news about politics and arts. On July 3rd, Vietnam Cinema Department announced that they were about to ban the Warner Brothers' upcoming Barbie film. The reason was because the scene featuring a map that showed the Chinese Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea, which the department considered as offensive and having violated its sovereignty. We have that scene for you. 
Here's a comparison of the nine dash line on actual map. Well, I would say the one in Barbie, if it's really a map, it's really abstract. I'm not the only one. Many Chinese netizens on social media are also surprised that Vietnamese could recognize the nine dash line on a twisted map in the film. They joke that no one has ever imagined that American movie companies are potential advocators of Chinese sovereignty. In recent years, Vietnam has made frequent moves contesting its claim in South China Sea. For instance, in 2019, DreamWorks animation film Abominable was banned by Vietnamese authority after having been released for just 10 days. Last year, Sony Pictures' film Uncharted, starred by Tom Holland, was banned for one week before releasing. Local authority claimed that both films contained the illegal image of China's Nine Dash Line in South China Sea. Next up, on July 3rd, the Hong Kong police obtained court approval for arrest warrants of eight individuals for allegedly violating the national security law in Hong Kong. The police department offered a reward of 1 million Hong Kong dollars for each of the wanted persons. The Hong Kong police said that the eight men were wanted for colluding with foreign forces and inciting secession. Hong Kong's chief executive John Lee urged the eight fugitives to turn themselves in, adding that the court may lighten the penalty if the defendants surrender voluntarily and give truthful confession and reveal the crimes of others. Later that day, the US, UK and Australia, countries of which the eight fugitives currently reside, condemned the Hong Kong authorities for offering bounties linked to pro-separatism activists based abroad. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning addressed those claims at a daily news briefing, said that Hong Kong affairs are purely Chinese internal affairs, relevant countries need to respect Chinese sovereignty and the rule of law in Hong Kong and stop providing a safe haven for fugitives. Chinese netizens are once again taken aback by the West's double standards. Netizens argued, what exactly are the differences between the rioters in Hong Kong and those who attacked Capitol Hill? None. So, in the eyes of the US, the rioters who broke into Capitol Hill were criminals breaking the law, while those arsonists, thugs and terrorists in Hong Kong were democracy activists. Well, as I say to myself, what a wonderful world. Next up, Sam's Club has just opened a new flagship store in Shenzhen. As all new stores do, it launched a limited giant cup noodles to celebrate. The cup noodle has an exaggerated shape up to 45 cm and priced at 168 won. Once it was put up, the cup noodle met with popular demand. It was soon sold out, and its price on secondary market reached as high as 500 won, three times the original price. Unlike the enthusiastic buyers, many netizens on social media are not so pleased about the giant cup noodle. Some netizens criticized Sam's Club for deliberately prompting hunger marketing. Others were shocked that people would pay that much for a giant cup that doomed to be disposed of in a few weeks. What are they gonna do with a cup? Put it in the living room next to the TV? What an example of impulse buying. Interestingly, as Sam's Club expanded its business in mainland China, its parent company, Walmart, in contrast, is closing down. If we search on Google, we'll find that Walmart has been closing stores since 2021. They have already closed its first Chinese supermarket on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the company's entering the market. The rise of high-end warehouse stores such as Sam's Club and Costco and the decline of Walmart and Carrefour reflects the shift in Chinese customer shopping habits. People are now more interested in high quality, not low price, a result of China's fast growth in the past decade. And next up, on July 4th, Iran gained permanent membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization at the 23rd summit of their organization. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who hosted the virtual summit, expressed its happiness and extended its best wishes to Tehran on accession to the SCO family. In response, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi expressed his hope that Iran's admission will create a platform for achieving collective security, sustainable development, and unity among member countries. Calling the SEO a symbol of this great family of civilizations that can establish new horizons of regional convergence and security building cooperation. On social media, Chinese netizens are surprised that diplomatic strategy that has been planned for years has finally achieved some results and celebrate for China-Russia Iran Big 3 moment. Considering Secretary of State Antony Blinken's recent comments on China, some Chinese netizens imitated his words and said, when it comes to US, we're going to do and say things that they don't like. Next up, a case about cats. 
On July 30th, a court in Shanghai held a hearing over a case of production and sale of counterfeit products. The defendant, Hu, was sentenced for 15 years in prison and fined 40 million yuan. What he sold was a homemade feline drug. Started in 2019, who cooperated with the pharmaceutical company to add a compound called GS441524 to an existing veterinary drug. GS441524 was proved to be miraculously effective for feline infectious peritonitis. However, the compound is a patented drug made by Gilead, which is, does not intend to produce for marketing. Therefore, whose drug is a counterfeit drug by legal terms. It was arrested in 2021. The case led to a discussion on Chinese internet. Cat lovers believed that Hu bought hope for the life of their cats and the sentence was too heavy. Others believed that Hu stole the patent and got a huge profit. A drug costing only 20 yuan was sold for over a thousand yuan. This penalty was not heavy at all for a case of total sale amount of 80 million yuan. Well, that's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts and comments on our show, please contact us at the email address below. I'm Chris, looking forward to hearing from you. Now let's move to Threshold, where Lisa is standing by to brief us on how some researchers from Harbin Medical University are analyzing how social isolation and loneliness can cause illness. In view of these strategies and technological advances, have been deployed to subdue these developments. Over to you, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China last week. A startling discovery by Chinese scientists could unlock a new window into the deepest mysteries of the universe. Using the world's largest radio telescope, FAST, researchers have detected gravitational waves at frequency billions of times lower than those found by LIGO, and at wavelengths of several light years. These nanohertz gravitational waves could reveal hidden black holes, the origin of the cosmos, and push the boundaries of physics. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space predicted by Einstein over a century ago. They are created by massive, accelerating objects like black holes or neutron stars. Though hard enough to detect, gravitational waves provide a new way to see the universe. In 2016, the LIGO experiment first directly detected gravitational waves from merging black holes. Now, the Chinese Pulsar Timing Array team has used a fast radio telescope to find evidence of gravitational waves billions of times lower in frequency. These nanohertz gravitational waves come in pairs of supermassive black holes orbiting in distant galaxies. Fast monitored radio signals from 57 pulsar, which act like cosmic clock. If a gravitational wave passes it, it can alter the pulsar timing slightly. After analyzing three years of fast data, scientists found patterns matching theoretical nanohertz gravitational waves. The discovery is consistent with those reported earlier this year by another pulsar timing array collaboration nanograph, but has a higher statistical significance and a lower level of noise in their analysis. Co-director of nanograph said they were fortunate to have the world's largest radio telescope. This allowed a significant detection in little time. The CPTA team plans to continue monitoring more pulsar and improving their sensitivity to detect and characterize the nanohertz gravitational wave background. They also hope to collaborate with other pulsar timing array projects around the world to form a global network that can enhance the scientific potential of this novel technology. These ripples from the dawn of time are bringing us closer to understand the deep mysteries that shape our universe. The exploration continues. With the rise of social media and remote work, the way we interact with each other is changing and our reliance on technology is growing. A new study has found that social isolation and loneliness are associated with an increased risk of death from all causes. The social isolation here means a lack of or limited social contact with others, which can be due to various reasons such as physical distance, illness, or personal choice, while loneliness refers to a subject emotional states. The study is a systematic review of meta-analysis of 90 cohort studies, 
from 1986 to 2022, involving more than 2.2 million participants from countries such as the United States, the United Kingdom, and Japan. All the study subjects were aged 18 or above, and 70% of them were aged 50 or above. The researchers from Harbin Medical University analyzed the study data to estimate the pooled effect size of social isolation and loneliness on mortality outcomes. The results showed that in the general population, both social isolation and loneliness were significantly associated with an increased risk of all-cause mortality and cancer mortality. Social isolation also highly increased the risk of cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. So what happened? The researchers noted that social isolation can promote unhealthy behaviours, including poor nutrition and lack of exercise, and has also been found to be associated with immune system dysfunction. Meanwhile, loneliness has been associated with sleep and immune system disorders. The research has its limitations, only 19 studies were analysed, and they used different measures for social isolation and loneliness. The participants were mainly from high-income countries. They recommended that more attention should be paid to social isolation and loneliness as potential risk factors for mortality, and that interventions should be developed to improve social relationships and well-being amongst individuals at risk. Snakes are a fascinating group of reptiles. Every Chinese know the famous idiom Hua She Tian Zhu, which translates to adding legs to painted snakes. It warns against unnecessary additions to something that is already perfect. But interestingly, according to a new study, snakes' ancestors originally had legs. How do snakes evolve to lose their legs, grow extra long bodies, and develop super senses? The groundbreaking study has deciphered the genetic code by sequencing the genomes of 14 snake species. This research represents the most extensive and detailed genomic analysis of snake ever conducted. Snakes first appeared in the early Cretaceous period, around 118 million years ago, and their ancestors had legs resembling the lizard we see today. Changes in the environment forced them to adapt to subterranean life. Limbs became hindrance to movement, and over millions of years, they gradually lost it. The study also suggests that snakes are sister Texas to lizards, such as king snakes and Komodo dragon, implying that some type of lizard may have been the ancestors of snakes. Limb loss often coincides with body elongation, and snakes can have several hundred vertebrae, two to three times the number found in other common vertebrates. In response to body elongation, the internal organs of snake undergo asymmetric development. For instance, the left lung often degenerates while the right lung becomes more developed. Some snake species have also developed exceptional sensory ability over time, such as the capacity to perceive infrared radiation. Pythons and vipers are known for their specialized infrared sensing organs, which aid in hunting and predator evasion in low light conditions. The study found that in these snakes, changes in genes and regulatory elements related to heat and temperature sensing allowed them to perceive infrared radiation. The findings help us to better understand the complex evolution of animals and offer valuable insights into animal genetic breathing and the examination of complex traits and diseases in humans. It can help us better understand lung diseases and limb deficiencies in humans by studying snakes with asymmetric lung development and limb loss. Additionally, the infrared sensing ability of snakes could contribute to advancement in bionic and blindness treatment. A team of researchers from the Chinese Academy of Science and Tianjin University has successfully created a tiny black hole on a superconducting chip using a chain of 10 qubits and 9 tunable couplers. Qubits are the building blocks of quantum computers, and couplers are the device that control the interactions between qubits. Black holes are some of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They are so massive that they wrap the fabric of space and time around them, where nothing, not even light, can escape their gravitational pull. 
However, according to scientists who proposed the quantum effects of gravity in the last century, black holes can still leak some particles through a process called quantum tunneling. This leakage is called Hawking radiation. It means that black holes will not exist forever, and their ultimate fate will be to evaporate and disappear. There are currently no experimental results that can directly verify the quantum effect of gravity because Hawking radiation is very faint and hard to observe in the real black holes. Since observing Hawking radiation in actual black hole is so elusive, scientists work to create an equivalent curved spacetime in a laboratory and study its related effects. Scientists have tried to mimic black holes using different things like water waves, cold atom, optical materials, and light. However, these things have some problems such as low efficiency, high noise, or difficulties in changing the parameters. In this study, scientists used a superconducting chip. The chip is a smart device that can manipulate qubits and couplers with high precision and flexibility. By changing the couplers, the researchers created a specific pattern that looks like the curved space near a black hole. They found evidence that the superconducting circuit is accurately stimulating the behavior of a black hole. In other words, they observed Hawking radiation from it and studied the influence of curved spacetime on quantum entanglement. The successful attempt provides a new method to study cold spacetime and the quantum effects of black holes. China is constructing its third icebreaker with the potential to explore deep polar seabed by 2025. This vessel could make China the second nation after Russia to reach the Arctic seafloor using crude submissibles. Primarily focusing on deep-sea scientific research, the icebreaker will spend part of the year at the North and South Poles while also supporting research in the South China Sea. With a length of 103 meters and a displacement of 920 tons, the versatile vessel can accommodate 80 people and travel at a speed up to 60 knots. Its main functions include unrestricted navigation, crude deep diving, deep sea exploration and support for experiments. It is expected to provide samples and environmental data for research on deep sea environments, geology and life science, as well as supporting testing and use of deep sea technology and equipment. In addition to its research capabilities, the vessel can support deep-sea archaeological exploration with submissibles. In 2022, China's submissible deep-sea warrior discovered more than 100,000 items, mostly porcelain, dating back around 500 years from two ancient shipwrecks in the South China Sea. And that is all for today's Threshold. We hope you like this new section on science and technology in China. We're also working on content about the ongoing US-China chip war. If you have any thoughts or questions on this topic, please let us know. Next is Thinkers Forum, where Professor Wen Yang, a researcher with China Institute at Feudal University, and Jim Roger, an American investor and financial commentator, will educate us on how China was never wiped out like other ancient civilizations and world history. Please stay. China has been around for a few thousand years, and many countries have, but in world history, China is the only country that's been at the top three or four times. China's also collapsed three or four times and been catastrophe. But in history, Rome was great once. Egypt was great once. Great Britain was great once. But China's been great three or four times. You totally collapse, but, and I don't know why, but it's the only country that after it's been at the bottom for a while, has turned around three or four times and risen to the top again. Mr. Rogers raised his question on a long civilizational time scale, stretched across six millennia. He mentioned the ancient Egyptian civilization, the Roman Empire, and the Great Britain Empire. So we'd better start with a brief outline of the world history. 
By the fourth millennium BC, the Egyptian civilization on the banks of the Nile and the Sumerian civilization in the Mesopotamian Valley had both reached the height of their glory. And around the same time, the Minoan civilization on the island of Crete also flourished. Although these civilizations seem to be developed independently, their life cycles follow a similar pattern. They reach their pinnacles, then collapse and disappear altogether after being invaded and conquered by outsiders. Why did these great civilizations fail to rise again and die out soon after? If an immortal specimen or look down on the eastern Mediterranean region from space at this time, he would notice that while most human groups in this region were hunters and gatherers, following food sources constantly on the move, living a nomadic lifestyle, in his birth view, the ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, and the Minoan civilizations, which developed into complex settled societies, were the outliers. The invention of solar and lunar calendars in ancient Egypt, the construction of large cities and the sophisticated irrigation system in ancient Sumer, and the building of great palaces and road networks on the ancient island of Crete are typical signs of long-term settlement. But for a long time, these civilizations were isolated and vulnerable, like small islands in the high sea in danger of being swallowed up by the raging waves, the invasion of the nomadic peoples. As the well-known English historian H.G. Wells put it, the two ways of life specialized in opposite directions. It was inevitable that the nomad folk and the settled folk should clash, that the nomads should seem hard barbarians to the settled peoples and the settled peoples soft and effeminate and a very good plunder to the nomad peoples. Along the fringe of developing civilizations, there must have been a constant reading and a bickering between hardy nomad tribes and the mountain tribes and the more numerous and less warlike peoples in the towns and the villages. Between 2278 and 2154 BC, Guten Horse invaded the Akkadian Empire, bringing an end to an existing civilization without building another in its place. Between 1790 and 1560 BC, the Hittites built an empire in Asia Minor. The ancient Babylonia Empire had lost most of its holdings to the south and the east. The ancient power centers of Sumer were thus largely destroyed and abandoned. Between 1782 and 1630 BC, the wandering western Semites seized the throne of Egypt and destroyed the Middle Kingdom. Between 1400 and 1200 BC, the palace of Gnosis was destroyed, never rebuilt, and left deserted. And finally, Sometimes around 1177 BC, the most murderous warriors known as Sea Peoples sailed to destroy the established world and start a new one. With their great migration as well came the downfall of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian inscriptions read in part, they came from the sea in their warships, and no one could stand against them. Resistance was futile. Their palaces were burned, and their cities distorted. This is the history of the Eastern Mediterranean area as a whole. It is the triumph of the nomad folks, the devastating conquest upon settled folks, one after another. But one could imagine, what if settled folks won? If, at some critical point, the society of sedentary people not only had a larger population and more land, but had also become well-organized, well-equipped, educated, and trained, and thus strong enough 
not only to defend their homes, but also to fight back against the Normans and take their base camps. The main historical narrative would have been very different. Now, if our immortal spaceman will look down on the east end of the Eurasia continent, he will see that in the same historical period, Contrary to what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean area, the story in China is the success of the settled fox, who assimilated and integrated with the nomad fox and followed by the Sicily's expansion of the sedentary civilization. We see that the Middle East and East Asia followed two distinct evolutionary paths. In the Middle East, the nomad fox conquered the entire set of the fox society, and then rebuilt a new society while retaining the nomad tradition on the ruins of the original civilization. In East Asia, through constant resistance and counter conquest, the settled fox eventually extended the entire set of the society to a larger area. And although it would also be ruled by powerful nomadic fox, from time to time, the new society still retain the tradition of sedentary civilization in essence. Miss Rogers also asked why the Roman Empire and the British Empire became number one for a single period of history and then never recovered after their decline. In fact, the Arab Empire in the 7th to 10th century the Mongol Empire in the 13th to 14th century, and the Ottoman Empire in the 16th to 19th century, all the same. They never resurrected after their collapse. Well, the fundamental reason is this. These empires were all nomadic dominated empires. Their rulers were either horse riding nomads or camel riding nomads or ship-riding nomads. And although the nomadic rulers also learned many cultural establishments and refined arts from the conquered, and gradually became part of the civilization, they all follow the same pattern of rise and fall. It begins with the unity upon kindred nomad tribes, then reaching their heyday in the war of conquest and settle down on the conquered land. Then, at the point in time quickly fall apart after the failure of the fresh overseas adventures or the failure of internal ethnic assimilation and cultural integration, or both. Take the Roman Empire as an example. The barbarian tribes that destroyed the Eastern Mediterranean civilizations were in fact the very creators of the ancient Greco-Roman civilization. Before the establishment of Alexander the Great's empire, the Celtic barbarians from Gaul entered Rome. 100 years later, Rome unified the Italian peninsula, and 200 years later, the Mediterranean Sea became a Roman lake. Under such circumstances, the new civilization not only took over all the settled lands of the old civilization, but also constituted a larger and more complex structure of settled society, in which it was no longer possible to revive the old civilizations of ancient Babylon, ancient Persia, and ancient Greece. But as the Roman Empire ran out of foreign settled societies to conquer, and its internal corruption grew. When its northern borders were invaded by the more powerful and ferocious Germanic barbarians, its downfall was inevitable. The rise and fall of the British Empire followed the same pattern. The seafaring pirate people from British islands, having mastered at once the navigation and the weaponry, conquered many settled societies on different continents and built a vast empire on which the sun never set. However, when there was no new settled society to conquer and more powerful rivals arose, it could not escape the same fate as other nomadic-dominated empires.
Now let's turn to China. One conclusion among the Western scholars is that Chinese civilization doesn't seem to have a beginning. As Dr. Henry Kissinger put it in his book, China strays into the historical consciousness as the established state requiring only restoration, not creation. Of course, the Chinese civilization has its beginning. But it is not a beginning with some kind of a victorious conquest which is more familiar with nomad folk. It is a decisive victory of settled folk who achieved solid unity of kindred villages and towns. From Xuan Yuan the Yellow Emperor to Da Yu the King of Xia, in the third millennia BC, all the legendary founding rulers of China were re-establishing not creating an empire of settled society. Each of these founding rulers made a unique contribution to the progress of settlement, not only in terms of cultural integration and ethnic assimilation, but also in terms of the periodical expansion of territory and population. Da Yu becoming the ruler of the Xia dynasty was a landmark event in history. In those ancient times, when great floods were common, people in other parts of the world had only two choices, to be swallowed up by flood or to flee far away from it. But the Chinese people, and only Chinese people, saw a third option, to rely on human power to level the land and divert the water. A chosen king with a high moral standard managed to unite all local laws gather massive human and material resources in his kingdom to complete this huge engineering project of flood control. And from then on, the settlement of the Chinese people were permanently fixed in the form of nine states, which have not changed for 4,000 years since then. Through large-scale water management project, Early Chinese sedentary societies greatly expanded their boundaries and effectively raised their critical point of survival from destruction by the surrounding nomadic societies. Ancient Chinese texts gave different names to the Norman folk in the directions of south, north, east, and west, showing that by this time, China's sedentary agricultural society had already expanded into an almost circular territory centered in the middle and the lower plain of the Yellow River, squeezing all the nomadic tribes into the remote surrounding area. This is why China came to be known as the Central Kingdom, although its size was sometimes larger and sometimes smaller. Mr. Rogers realized that China has fallen many times in history. There have been many periods of civil war, interregnum, and chaos in Chinese history. These periods he refers to are no other than the similar dark ages when China, as an agricultural society of settled folk, was overtaken by nomad folk. Around the same time as when the Germanic barbarians invaded the Roman Empire, Quite a few wandering tribes living in northern China, known collectively as the Five Hoos, finally became strong enough to break through the defense boundaries of northern China. However, unlike the Roman Empire, which completely collapsed under the attack and could not be rebuilt, the Five Hoos entered China and embraced the Chinese culture based on sedentary civilization and become part of the new central kingdom. After a century of great integration, the great empires of the Sui and the Tang dynasties, as a reconstruction of Qing and Han dynasties, encompassed more people, covered larger territories, and reached higher culture peaks. Then, history repeated itself. In the 13th century, the Mongol Empire, the greatest steppe empire in human history, rose almost overnight, sweeping over much of the known world, including all of China, 
but unlike the rest of the world, the Mongol dynasty that was established in the land of the Central Kingdom once again out of their own tradition. It was not a nomadic Mongol empire anymore, but to a great extent a copy of the Qing and Han sedentary kingdoms. In the case of China, although the rulers were replaced by the foreigners, its own culture sphere actually expanded into the ruler's homeland. Furthermore, because of the ever-elevating critical point of survival, after each collapse as if by law of nature, the Chinese state has increased its capacity to rebuild itself. The great unification of Ming and Qing dynasties from the 15th to the 19th century was a repetition of history, encompassing more peoples, covering a larger territory, and reaching a higher culture peak. At this point, I believe I have answered Ms. Rogers' question in a very comprehensive way. So, knowing all of this, how should we understand the world as it is today? First, we need to recognize that the great rejuvenation of Chinese nation today is still with its uniqueness and can't be compared to or predicted by the rise and fall of other empires in history. Comparing China to Germany and Japan in recent history, or see China as an emerging superpower that threatens existing world order are misleading, if not incorrect. The historical process of China from its decline to its rejuvenation since the late days of the Qing Dynasty can still be seen as a repetition of history. That is, the rejuvenation of its own tradition and the gradual creation of a new civilization by absorbing elements from different civilizations. This is the unique characteristics of Chinese civilization and the fundamental reason why it became the most continuous and successful settled civilization in the world. On a global scale, since the end of the 19th century, with stronger sovereignty of the nation-states, tighter border controls, and increasing urbanization, the phenomenon of great migration of ethnic groups have gradually disappeared. Well, the population of settled societies has increased dramatically. Compared to most times of the human history, we can say that the world today is a globally settled world. They are no longer an entire society of horse riding or camel riding or boat riding people. If we take an outline of world history and regard the European colonial and the imperialist wars of conquered in the 17th to the 19th centuries as the last great victory of Norman folk over settled folk in the recent six millennia. Then, the flourishing of sedentary societies throughout the world since the 20th century, especially since the end of the Second World War, means that sedentary civilization has finally dominated the globe, and that we have reached some kind of the end of history. Now, we are entering a new era, the era of global sedentarization, in which all countries in the world are facing new challenges. Why are there more and more internal conflicts in Western countries? Why has China continuously proposed global initiatives, BRI, building a community with a shared future of mankind, GSI, GDI, and GCI? The answers lie in the historical perspective described above. That's all for today's edition of China Now. I hope you had an amazing time while we learned together. I look forward to hearing your thoughts, comments, feedbacks, and suggestions. So kindly share them with us through the email provided below. My name is Stanley Kobla. I could see you same time next week.